Good evening and welcome to our Friday COVID webinar. We are going to wait just a few more minutes as people continue to log on and then we will get started. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our Friday webinar series. Today's webinar is on staying active, coping during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Kate Naumacher. I'm the Vice President of Education here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point in this webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please go ahead and use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have staff members who are monitoring these questions, which we will pose to the panel at the end of the presentation. So we'll collect them all and ask them then. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Monday the 27th. I would like to introduce our panelists this evening. We have Dr. Len Valentino, President and CEO of the National Hemophilia Foundation, Kim Bauman, physical therapist at the Center for Bleeding and Clotting Disorders um, in Minnesota, and Laura Joyner, physical therapist and hemophilia treatment center coordinator at East Carolina University. Welcome to our entire panel. We're very excited to have each of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Valentino to get us started. Thank you, Kate. Good evening. Uh, good morning to everybody who's on the call. <clears throat> we hope that you're staying safe and we're glad that you're able to join us today. So I'm really pleased to have uh, uh, Laura and, and Kim here with us, but I wanted to start out as I usually do with a little bit of statistics about COVID-19. So as of this afternoon, there are 2,790,000 cases worldwide uh, with almost 190,000 deaths worldwide. In the United States, we're almost to 900,000 cases and 50,000 deaths. So there, there's multiple hotspots in the United States, as you can see on the map, where uh, these red areas are, are located. And obviously, we've been hearing a lot about uh, uh, the Washington State area, where much of this first started, and then New York, but also Los Angeles, Denver, as well as uh, Chicago and Detroit. So please uh, do your best to stay safe uh, and follow the regulations that have been uh, put forth by your local communities as well as state and federal uh, authorities. Next slide. So one thing I'd like to address um, before we get into the, the webinar on activity is the issue around thrombotic events with heme libra. The first thing I'd like to point out is that we have known that blood clots occur in people with coagulation disorders for many, many years. And this is increased in people who are receiving replacement therapies. And I just put this table in here that was kindly provided by Professor Mike Macris um, in Sheffield in the UK uh, on the, his analysis of the rate of blood clots that have occurred with four products uh, previously. And this data was collected over a decade uh, that ended in uh, 2017. And you can see that uh, the rate is anywhere from about seven per 10,000 treated patient years up to as high as 23 per 10,000 treated patient years. We know that heme libra is thought to confer a mild to moderate phenotype in persons with severe hemophilia A. Hence, it is a blood clotting agent. We have very approximate uh, figures for heme libra that come from the uh, emicizumabinfo.com site. And it's estimated that there are about 16 per 10,000 person years uh, with this product. So you can see that it's right in the same range where we see for other uh, procoagulant products. So although this has created a lot of emotion in the community recently with the uh, report that just came out, we don't believe that this is uh, out of uh, uh, the ordinary, but we continue to monitor this as we do with all blood clotting agents that are used in our population. It's important that we remain vigilant 
and that if there are any uh, unexpected safety signals that emerge with any of the products that are used for our patients, you will definitely hear about that immediately. So if there are any questions, we'd like to hear about that. But at this point, we're watching and we're continuing to do surveillance. Uh, and we'll let you know if, if we believe or the, any of the experts believe that there's an unexpected uh, safety signal. Next slide. So one of the things that's really important is for you to stay active during COVID-19 and the risk for coronavirus infection. The World Health Organization has come out with some recommendations and our two speakers are going to talk about those recommendations uh, from the WHO as well as other sources, including the National Hemophilia Foundation on subsequent slides. Next slide. And remember that you're never too old to rock out. So even our, our older uh, individuals in the community, uh, the more mature people, you can still do activities. And we'll talk about what some of those safe activities are in a few slides. Next slide. So what are the recommendations and why would you want to be physically active? Well, as you heard last week in our mental health webinar, issues around depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and cognitive decline are all issues. Physical activity can help uh, reduce the risk for these and even wart them off. There are some uh, recommendations on the amount and intensity of activity as well as their frequency but I wanna make sure that you recognize that you should consult your HTC about the type, intensity, and duration of physical activity that you're planning. Next slide. So if you don't, exer don't exercise, if you have fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, stay at home and rest, seek medical attention, but as I've said on previous webinars, call in advance. Don't just show up in the emergency room or at your HTC. There may be other opportunities for you to access care, such as telemedicine that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Follow the directions of your local health authority if you do need to go to a healthcare facility. If you're able to go for a walk or a bike ride, always practice physical distancing. Wash your hands before, during, and after your activity. And if water and soap are not immediately available, a hand, uh, or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer could be used as well. Next slide. If you go to an open space to walk, run, or exercise, follow those same guidelines about practicing physical distancing. And you know, I, I don't like the term social distancing. We talk about physical distancing. Wash your hands with soap and water again. Uh, use the uh, hand sanitizer if you don't have access to soap and water, and follow the directions of your local health authority in regards to any restrictions on the number of people with you or restrictions on the use of public outdoor spaces or exercise equipment. And again, remember, if you're not regularly active, start slowly with low intensity, choose the right activity so that you reduce your risk of injury, and above all, contact your HTC to get some recommendations from your physiotherapist or the nurses at your center. Next slide. One important thing to think about is avoiding unnecessary injury. Now this is important for at least two reasons. One is for your own personal well-being. Don't put yourself at excess risk doing something that might be risky. And secondly, if you do get injured, and you need to seek medical attention, that adds an additional burden onto the healthcare system, which we know is already overburdened. So please choose your activities wisely. Consult your physiotherapist before you begin any activity routine if you're not used to doing it. So now I'd like to turn it over to Kim to take uh, us through the physical activity recommendations. Kim? Thanks, Dr. Valentino. So first of all, we asked, you know, what is physical activity? Um, in a nutshell, it's any movement of your body that counts as physical activity. So we don't want people to become overwhelmed by the idea that they need to take on a, a big exercise program or join some sort of sport. Um, increasing from our usual baseline is, is really what the focus should be and what's important. Um, co committing to being active doesn't mean that you have to join a fitness center. And this is even outside of the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in right now. At any time, it doesn't mean you need to be on a sports team or join a fitness center. It's just making a commitment to 
using your muscles, moving your body, moving your joints, and increasing your breathing and your heart rate. Some examples of this include gardening, walking, and even house cleaning. Next slide, please. So physical activity can be included um, in lots of ways in our everyday life. Um, we can incorporate this um, by being a little bit more creative at this time. Uh, that's something that people are struggling with is our, our usual activities have greatly decreased. And so we may have to get creative and find ways to seek out some more physical activity. Remember with any of these, uh, phys any physical activity increase in activity, always to look for age appropriate and safe ways to be active. Next slide, please. Last week, uh, for those people who were able to attend the webinar last week, uh, Sandra and John uh, talked a lot about that forgetfulness and trouble concentrating, those kind of things are, um, can happen from the stress and anxiety that people are feeling during this time. So that's one of the ways that physical activity can be helpful is some of those benefits, those body and mind benefits. So obviously we get the body benefits, the muscle strengthening, the flexibility uh, can help with weight management, but also that confidence in our body and that it's strong and that it's um, able to move how we'd like it to, helping to risk, uh, reduce the risk of depression and improve general well-being. And then as they talked about with that forgetfulness and trouble concentrating, um, exercising has also been found to help improve our attention and academic performance for those of us with kiddos out there. Many people are also experiencing significant changes to their usual activity. So if you think about what it usually takes in the morning to get up and get ready and with those of us with kids, get the kids ready, get everybody dressed, get breakfast, get everybody out the door, into the car, drop off here, drop off there, walk into work. All of those things are activity and a lot of that has really decreased at this time. And so we need to find ways to build that back into our, into our daily activities. Next slide, please. Before I talk about intensity, I want to really reiterate that activity is all, any activity is always better than none. So I don't want people to get too hung up on all of the guidelines. We will go over specific guidelines tonight on the recommendations for how many minutes and different types of activities. And while those are important, I just want to encourage everybody to, to feel confident to start somewhere, to do something to move above and beyond your usual activity and to use your HTC, HTC physical therapist to help with that. Um, we are there uh, even during this time for you to reach out to and ask questions and we can help develop a program for you. So what is intensity? Oop, can you go back one? Thanks. So what is intensity? It's the level of effort required to do an activity. Um, one great way to gauge this is called the talk test. A lot of people have probably heard of this, but I'll just remind you about the talk test. So if you're doing moderate intensity activity, as it says here on the bottom of the slide, you should be able to talk but not sing, meaning that you're breathing enough that you can't get a big enough breath that you could sing. If you're doing vigorous intensity activity, you shouldn't be able to say more than a few words before having to take another breath because you're increasing your heart rate, increasing your breathing, and so you can't have that continuous conversation. Next slide, please. So what about physical activity when sick? Uh, a general thing that a lot of people refer to, there's a lot of resources out there, um, is called the neck check. So what this means is if your symptoms are above the neck, so nasal congestion, watery eyes, sneezing, it's still okay to exercise. If the symptoms are below the neck, so more systemic, more affecting your whole body, such as anything in the lungs, so coughing, fever, body aches, stomach issues, um, during those times, it's more important to rest until those uh, symptoms have resolved. Next slide, please. And then specifically staying active during COVID-19. Uh, so Dr. Valentino touched on this as well. Uh, most importantly, it's important to follow the direction of your medical team. Uh, reach out to your HTC, your primary care, whoever it is if you have specific concerns. Secondly, recommendations from the World Health Organization have talked about 
uh, washing your hands before you leave your house. So if you are able to safely get out of the house for activity, wash your hands before leaving, wash your hands when you arrive at your destination or use a um, alcohol-based sanitizer or, and then wash again as soon as you get home. And then a lot of uh, the news reports, and there's a lot of, of talk out there right now, people have probably heard about changing the terminology from social distancing to physical distancing. So it's important that we physically distance from each other. So we, we um, follow those guidelines about the physical distance, but social connections are so important. Um, so seeking ways to physically distance, but continue to be socially connected. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in further slides with some of the activities that we recommend. So I'll turn it over to Laura now to give a little more information. Thanks, Pam. So now I'm going to talk about specifics related to physical activity with persons um, for persons with bleeding disorders. The World Federation of Hemophilia recommends that physical activity be encouraged to promote fitness, and neuromuscular health with special attention paid to muscle strengthening, coordination, general fitness, body weight, and self-esteem. Um, as has been said in several of the slides already, always check um, with your HTC and physical therapist before beginning any new or any physical activity. And I wanted to emphasize again too that your HTCs are available to answer questions. Many are modifying their hours of operation um, and care to some degree, but they are available for um, answers to your questions. Also remember that there's many resources online and out there um, available, but you wanna make sure that you're getting um, official information to avoid um, misinformation and confusion. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the benefits of physical activity for persons with bleeding disorders are many, and it's been well-researched, and a lot of them are the same as the benefits for the general population. Um, some of them, the main benefit um, for persons with bleeding disorder is for optimal joint health. An active lifestyle um, will help prevent muscle and joint bleeds, it can help maintain healthy weight, strengthen the muscles around the joints, and again, improve emotional health. Um, the benefit of weight loss can contribute to lessening the pressure on those weight-bearing joints, and it can also assist in moving waste products out of the joints and moving the fluid out of the joint space, which can lead to decreasing in joint arthropathy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Some considerations for physical activity for people with bleeding disorders. This is a, a very important slide and there's a lot of information that can go into this slide. Um, is the main consideration you want to not fall into is that weekend warrior trap. So don't go all out on a new sport, a new activity, your home, you're going to try something new. Um, be realistic with your goals and expectations. Start slow. Um, contact your HTC or PT with any questions, but more specifically for your bleeding disorder, um, consider your severity of your disorder. Um, if you have a mild disorder, usually you only bleed after a significant trauma, so therefore you usually can participate in most activities, um, and mostly you can do vigorous activities without medical treatment. However, you're also less likely to recognize activity-related bleeds or less likely to infuse um, after a bleed. So it's important to remember that every single bleeding episode can lead to joint damage. Um, if you have a moderate bleeding disorder, you usually determine your sports and activities much like we base our severe disorders. So the severity of your disorder is very important for consideration of physical activity. Um, your body specific risks like target joints, past bleeding history, present joint condition really will help to determine what activity you choose. If you have um, target knees, for example, are you going to do an activity that requires you to bend and um, straighten your knees multiple times, like running up and down stairs? Um, should you be doing a running program if you have target ankles and, and knees? So your body specific risks are something also to consider. Um, sport specific risks, swimming versus baseball versus football are also things that need to be taken into account. 
Um, intensity, there are definite differences between organized and pickup games. While pickup games are sometimes less competitive, they are often not as supervised and you may not have access to the proper safety gear. Um, they can be more demanding. Um, organized sports can be more demanding and physical, but they often tend to be more supervised. Um, so you have to think about all of these considerations. Another consideration that I discuss with my patients a lot is the lifetime involvement and progression of sport. Um, a lot of times a child playing soccer is much different than an older teen or an adult in a soccer league. As you get older, those sports become more physical and the risk for injury may be increased. Um, the contact is going to be more for an adult. So when considering a sport choice, consider interest level, the progression, and the risk of injury as you age. So all of these considerations need to be taken into account when you choose an activity, think about your own body, your own individual risks. Um, and your HTC and your physical therapist is a great resource for looking at these specific considerations for people with bleeding disorders. Um, now Kim is going to talk about some specifics for adults. Next slide, please. Thanks, Laura. All right, so let's talk some specific activity for adults. This first slide is based on the uh, recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control. Again, um, as highlighted at the top there in red, any activity is better than none. So I encourage you to try something, um, but also uh, work towards these goals, these recommendations as the, the um, best way to try and stay active and improve your physical uh, activity. So for adults age 18 to 64, it's recommended that we get at least 150 minutes of exercise or of physical activity, I should say, per week in that moderate intensity level. So remembering back to that talk test. In addition to that, two days a week of strengthening activities. When we move into looking at adults age 65 and older, those same recommendations apply. But in addition, it's recommended to include balance activities. And this is because balance becomes an increasing challenge as we age. Next slide, please. So there's so many options out there right now for staying active. And there's actually a lot of really great free options and free trials during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so I encourage people to look into that. When you're transitioning to staying active at home, a good place to start is to identify days and times that you have available, what types of activity or exercise are you interested in? How are you gonna stay motivated and hold yourself accountable? Uh, what's your available space and equipment? And then um, always considering the safety concerns. Next slide, please. So when we talk about days and times, using just a paper calendar or an electronic calendar can be really helpful um, in making some plans around this. So this can be as simple as setting a timer on your phone every hour when you're working to remind you to pause, get up, change position, uh, maybe go fill your water bottle, walk around for five minutes and, and, and take a little body break. Or actually blocking time on your work calendar I know we're all really busy and I, I think a lot of people would agree with um, those of us that are working at home some days, it feels like there's never an off time. You feel like you're always working because the, the information is right there. You feel like you should be checking email. And so making sure to set some boundaries and also really schedule time or block time on your calendar for activity during the day. With changes in people's usual schedules right now, um, it is presenting some new opportunities. So for example, for me, um, on the days that uh, I'm at home, I don't have my typical commute, which is a really long commute morning and night. So I have found that I can actually exercise in the morning now, which I didn't do before because I'm not much of a morning person, but that presented a new opportunity for me. So looking at some of those new opportunities such as uh, change in commute, or is there time over lunch, um, or maybe even during those commercials. I know most of us, there's not a lot of commercials anymore, but, or in between, uh, before the next episode on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and then finding an activity buddy. 
So whether this is somebody in your household or this is somebody that you're connecting with um, through social media, somebody that's holding you accountable um, and helping to motivate. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about some types of specific uh, physical activity or exercise. Um, start with what you're already doing. So what were you doing before all of this happened? And look into those places. Maybe if you had a fitness membership, they may have some online options now, be offering some um, fitness classes online, free activities, those types of things. So that's a good place to start. Um, there's also other free online options that you may not have looked into in the past. Just make sure that you're specific when you're doing that. So for example, if you, have, if you live in a small home in an apartment or a small space, make sure when you go to search for activities that you search for activities for you know, working out or doing, being physically active in a small space. Um, or if you happen to have, uh, let's say you have ankle issues or knee issues, uh, search specifically for activities that are low impact um, or even seated activities. There's lots of exercise programs that you can do completely from um, sitting in a chair. And also remember that you have a wonderful resource in your HTC physical therapist. So please reach out to us. Um, you know, we're more than happy to help and to look at those specific online activities that you're considering, um, you know, and look at it from the individualized need, you know, Let's say we know that you have a right knee target joint, but then we can talk through specifics about what to do. Next slide, please. Some more activity ideas. Um, so taking the stairs to meetings. And what I mean by this is uh, when we're physically going into the clinic, going into our office, whatever it is for our work, we often need to get up and walk to a different building, go upstairs, go downstairs to meet with people. Now, many of us are finding ourselves locked in one room all day long. So try and build back in those normal things. So if you have a meeting coming up, get up five to 10 minutes ahead of time, go walk the stairs in your home or walk around the house for five or 10 minutes, sort of mimicking that usual activity that it would have taken to go to those meetings. Um, stand up when you're on work calls or even walk if you're on a call, you know, if you have the ability to do that, um, you know, move around while you're, while you're on those calls. I know that a lot of us are feeling a lot of Zoom fatigue these days. It feels like that's all we're doing. So try and take, you know, take that with you and, and walk around while you're on those calls. Um, stand on one foot while you're brushing your teeth. You're supposed to brush our teeth for two minutes, stand on the right foot for a minute, stand on the left foot for a minute. We just built a uh, balance activity into your day. If you're a captive audience, you got to brush your teeth anyhow, so try and add that in. Or think about doing a new activity every time, you know, you get up and you leave whatever space you're working in and you're going to go get some water, you're going to get a snack, which I know uh, that's a difficult thing right now. Either that kitchen is just right there. So try and build in an activity while you're doing that. Do some lunges uh, on your way to the refrigerator. Do some counter push-ups while you're waiting for something to heat up in the microwave. Maybe even do the crab walk and see if your kids think that you've completely lost your mind. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier, um, and I'm gonna highlight again here, that it's important to have somebody or some way to help keep yourself motivated and keep yourself on track. Uh, one way to do this is to set up um, an activity challenge, maybe with your family members or with your friends could be as simple as um, you know, just counting your steps in the day. A lot of people have all the fancy watches and stuff now. So challenging each other to who can get the most steps or let's all try and get this many steps today. Um, or you could make a checklist, checklist for yourself. If you're like me, you really like checklists, feel like you accomplish something when you check it off. So make a list of things you're gonna do that week. You're gonna, you're gonna do the strengthening two days a week. You're gonna walk, you know, 30 minutes a day and 10 minute intervals, intervals or whatever it is, and then check those things off so that you kind of celebrate that success. Um, this has come into play for me right now as well. I have a teenage daughter who is usually gone all the time at her volleyball practices and all of her strength training, and she's needing to do that all at home. And so she's asked me to try out some new things with her. And like, for example, last night, that was the last thing that I wanted to do after a long day. And if she hadn't been there asking me to do that with her, I would not have been doing my strengthening exercises last night. But I did because I had somebody there motivating me. And I'm sore today. Next slide, please. 
Uh, look at your available space and equipment. So if you're going to be doing something indoors, you need to make sure that you're clearing a path um, so that it's safe, clearing space so that any activity you're doing, you're not going to accidentally wing your arm out there and punch a wall or something. So make sure that you're making it a safe space. Um, same thing for outdoors, uh, looking at available trails and spaces where there's not a lot of people. And also consider the time of day if you're going to be going out of doors. Um, there's certainly a lot of people or likely more people going to be out over lunch hours, right after the work hour. Um, so try and maybe go a little bit later where it's easier to physically distance yourself. Um, whether it's during the COVID-19 pandemic or any other time, uh, fancy equipment is not needed. And I, I tell my patients this all the time and I really feel strongly about this. We don't have to have a fitness membership. We don't have to have a home gym. There's lots of ways that we can find resistance um, and, and do activity at home. The one thing that we all have handy is our body weight. Body weight resistance is a great way to do strength training, is a great way to um, keep our muscles strong. So you can reach out to your HDC physical therapist for specific ideas, um, but things like you know wall push-ups, counter push-ups, stair push-ups, squats, lunges, all of those things are just simply using our body weight as resistance. Um, you can also get really creative with uh, the DIY home uh, exercise equipment. You can even search that. There's all kinds of ideas out there. I actually had a patient just this week who I was seeing for a video visit who had taken two socks and put a soup can in the bottom of each and then tied, it tied them together. And then that's what he was hanging over his ankle to to do the resistance exercises that I was going over with him. And I thought that was super creative. Some other ideas are listed here to kind of replicate some of those things that you see in a fitness center. So like dumbbells, you can grab soup cans, water bottle either with the water in it or once it's gone, filling it with sand or corn kernels. Um, the bench or the incline bench that you see at a fitness center, you can replicate this with a really stable chair, not a chair that's gonna break or tip over but a stable chair or the stairs, um, the kettlebells that are really popular. You can find a paint can or an ice cream bucket. I know we have a lot of those in my house. Uh, once they're empty, fill that with sand or corn kernels and you'll get that similar kind of lifting of a kettlebell. Um, the ankle weights that I talked about already um, and then the medicine balls that we also see a lot, holding a heavy book or using a backpack in reverse. You can really change how heavy that is by putting different items in the backpack and that can um, replicate a medicine ball. Next slide, please. And finally, the most important thing before starting any new activity um, is always to, to consider your safety. So keep your health and safety uh, as your foremost concern. Reach out to your HTC physical therapist as a resource before you start anything. Um, Consider all the, you know, the safety things around this COVID-19 pandemic, but I encourage everybody to get out there and physically distance, but be socially connected and physically active. I'll turn it back over to Laura for some pediatric specifics. Okay, so now we're going to talk about activity guidelines for children, um, infant through age 17. Um, and we're, the World Health Organization and the CDC has established guidelines for healthy activity sleep and screen time behaviors. And just a disclaimer, um, depending on what source you use and what year that you look at that the source was written, these guidelines may vary a little bit. So just take that into consideration. And also during this time, when I look at, when you look at screen time, especially for school age children, um, I am going to be talking about screen time, but you have to keep in mind that that is recreational screen time. So, of course, our screen time for our school age children has significantly increased during this time. So, for infants, um, infants considered less than one year of age, um, they are physical activity. They need to be physically active several times a day in a variety of ways, especially interactive floor time. Um, it is recommended that they have zero minutes of screen time and less than 60 minutes of what's called restrained time. And restrained means anything that keeps them in an immobile position, such as strollers, high chairs, bouncy seats, bumbo seats, um, strapped to a parent with those new age, whatever, strapping things, um, car seats, anything that keeps them immobile. 
um, and they recommend at least 30 minutes of tummy time a day. Um, and the most important thing for an infant is sleep time, 14 to 17 hours for zero to three months and 12 to 16 hours for four to 11 months. Next slide, please. Then you move up to a one to two year old. Again, for a, um, a one year old, less than two years, zero minutes of screen time. And for a two year old, less than 60 minutes, then you're gonna need at least 180 minutes in a variety of types and a variety of types of physical activity. And here it says, including moderate to this, um, vigorous. So enough activity that they are gonna have some difficulty talking while they are doing that activity. They're not gonna be able to sing while they're doing that activity. Um, and then the um, including 11 to 14 hours of sleep time. And I want to make a note here that the importance of a regular wake and sleep time is added at this age. And it, um, I think the hot thing to highlight is regular. So regular nap times um, at one to two years of age. Okay, next slide, please. Again, um, children three to four years of age, it's um, still listed as 180 minutes of physical activities, but then it gets specific at this age of 60 minutes daily of moderate to vi vigorous activities. So specifically 60 minutes was included at this age, less than 60 minutes per day of screen time and 10 to 13 hours of sleep per, uh, per day including regular wake and sleep time. So nap time is still included in three to four year olds. Next slide. And then for our five to 17 year olds, this is where it gets more specific. 60 minutes a day of moderate to vig vigorous activity, mostly aerobic. So this is again where they're gonna have, you want to consider that intensity talk test. Um, and then included at this age as well is three days per week of bone and muscle strengthening activities. So this is the first age range where we see the bone and muscle strengthening activities and um, recreational screen time less than 120 minutes per day. So again, keep in mind that that's recreational screen time in addition to what you're online doing for your schooling. Um, eight to 11 hours of sleep time, and this does not include nap time. So nap times are not included. Um, there's no more napping after five years of age. It's not uh, considered important anymore to take a nap, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, um, next slide. And then this is just a summary slide because the other slides had screen time and nap time, but this is just for the physical um, activity. Um, so we've already reviewed that. This is just a summary slide of just the physical activity slide. And again, remember the slight variations you'll see depending on what source you look at. And as Kim has said, the most important thing for children is just to be active. Um, they need a kid, should, that's, their, that's their role in life is to be active. Okay, next slide, please. So how do you get um, children to be physically active at home? And um, I like to talk about three main words, make, do, and go. Um, <clears throat> we'll and we'll get real specific in the next few slides, but um, a Montessori quote is the most important role that play can have is to help children be active, make choices and practice actions to mastery. Play, and activity is a role, is the main role of, in life for children, is to play and be active. So the role of parents, even more so when they're younger, is to set up opportunities for active, fun play. Um, and this will help them establish healthy habits, and it will require less assistance and guidance as the child grows, but it is a lot of work for them when they're younger. Um, and as Kim said too, or in her slides, it'll also help the parent be more physically active. It'll help the um, parents to st establish healthy habits too. But so you make it fun, dancing, scavenger hunts, you do it together, exercising, working out, household chores, and you go, you go outside, you go for a walk, you go do something. Okay, next slide please. So some specific ideas to be physically active outdoor. Um, it's always fun to have a theme. Um, and there's been lots of themes during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. 
I've seen lots of things going on in different neighborhoods. Um, one of them I've seen around is going on a bear hunt. Um, people put bears in their windows in neighborhoods and you just walk with your children around the neighborhoods and find all the bears in the windows. Or you put a word in a window, encouraging words in the windows and you walk with your children around the neighborhoods and find the different words in the windows. You can go on a scavenger hunt. Um, neighborhood events, um, minute to win it. And from a physical distance, you stay physically distanced apart and you can do neighborhood events. Um, one of the things that um, play outdoor games, I think it's a shame when a child doesn't know what capture the flag is or what freeze tag is, but play those outdoor games. Um, hopscotch, any kickball games, relay races, even if they have to do it themselves, relay races. So those are just some um, outdoor physically active things that you can do with your child. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Some indoor physically active at home ideas. Um, and these take a little bit of work if you need to set them up with your child. Um, and there's lots of ideas on um, Pinterest and Google and all those social media activity um, places that you can look. Hallway soccer, um, you know, clear the hallway and let them play soccer inside. Broom hockey. Get a broomstick and a, a little foam ball and let them play hockey inside. Balloon volleyball is a great thing. A balloon and a child is, will create um, activity for a long time. Um, Kim was talking about crab walking for the adults. Well, imitate a lot of different animals. Crab walking, bear walking, um, jumping like a kangaroo. You can get a lot of physical activity imitating various different animals and the parents can participate as well. Hula hooping, um, laser tag maze with yarn or painter's tape and I have a picture of that um, in a couple of slides. Um, snowball fighting with rolled up socks. All of those are just fun activities that you can do inside that'll um, cause your child to be active and play. They don't know they're being active, they think they're just playing. Okay, next slide, please. Some more ideas. Um, you can set up activity stations, jumping jacks, squats, standing on one foot, Simon says, um, any kind of jumping. Jumping is one activity that will definitely increase your heart rate. It is definitely a moderate to vigorous activity, especially the more repetitions, the more vigorous it becomes. Um, so any type of jumping is a um, great exercise to do um, or great physical activity to do. Up, down, forwards, backwards, side to side, um, and make it a game. Jump from over, you know, frogs on lily pads. Um, so it doesn't matter, the, you know, what the activity is, it's the creativity that goes into it. Okay, <clears throat> so next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. So these are just some different pictures that um, that show. So the first um, first one is a obstacle course on the inside of your house um, that's made with painter's tape um, that they can you know go through in your living room. Um, the second one is uh, made with yarn and it's a laser tag yarn um, obstacle course. The next two is showing a relay race with a young toddler. And so it's accomplishing a lot of things. They're running back and forth in a relay race by themselves, sorting colors. Um, you know, you could have them hop one time they go to get something out of the basket. You could have them skip the next time they go get something out of the basket. You could do a lot of different things with colors and different various gross motor activities to make that more physically active. Um, sidewalk chalk, you can do hopscotch, draw different patterns and just get them outside. A family game of soccer. And then the last one is, you know, just playing tag. Just some different ideas um, in pictures. Okay, next slide, please. And as Kim said, for the adults, it's the same thing um, with the pediatric and kids. Use things that you have at home. Um, 
you know, be creative. You don't have to buy expensive things. You probably have stuff around the house that you can use. Um, I love painter's tape. You can make a lot of different um, activities out of that. They can jump over it. You can make um, tight ropes, you know, balance beams, step stools to step up and down. Just make sure that it's stable so that it's not going to tip. It's not going to break. Um, couch cushions, pillows, blankets make great for walking over, working on their balance, um, balloons, balls, household cleaning items. Um, for some reason, children love to clean the house. I wish they would continue to love to do that when they get to be teenagers. Um, but that's always good exercise to let them vacuum and mop. Okay, next slide, please. Um, Sidewalk chalk, rolled up socks to work on that throwing. And anytime you incorporate some upper extremity and arm movement, that's also going to be things that's going to increase your heart rate and strengthen your arms. Cans of food or water bottles for weights. Um, paper plates or socks for skates. You put um, some paper plates under your feet and it's like you can skate uh, across your hardwood floor instead of having to skate on ice and fall down and hurt yourself. Um, a t-shirt or a blanket you can sit on and scoot yourself across the room. I don't know if anybody has tried to scoot themselves across the room on your bottom, but that's a pretty good workout. Um, and then any toys to sort or categorize for relays. Okay. And then there's some more um, just pictures of materials, just regular old household materials, plates, socks, a step stool cans of food, balloons, and the picture of a relay obstacle course fort made in your house and a household broom that you can use uh, to, to clean up and work out. There's lots of um, be creative. Remember, they don't have to be expensive. Use what you have around the house. And there's plenty of ideas available online. And again, just remember um, safety first. Some of them, um, you know, you want to be safe. You don't want them jumping off the top of the couch, especially a young child with a bleeding disorder. Um, but fun, I think, is the name of the game when you're trying to um, encourage a healthy habit of being physically active. We have listed some general references and resources. We did not list specific exercise programs. Um, there's a, a lot out there. Um, and I think each individual need is different. And again, we felt like that was something that you needed to talk with your specific therapist or HTC team. Um, so we do have um, specific, some references listed there for the CDC and the time recommendations. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists for so many really good background, but also like all these creative ideas. Um, you guys motivated me. I literally stood up and started stepping in place to get my little Fitbit here to boost the numbers while you all were talking. So thank you so much for that. Um, we did have a couple questions come in, so I'll go ahead and start with the first. Um, if a patient starts ex exercising and has bleeding, how long do you recommend to interrupt the exercises and apply rice? Uh, I can go ahead and take that one, or Laura, if you want to answer from a pediatric standpoint when I'm done. But um, so for adults, um, so I appreciate, uh, Anthony, the question and that you, that you did uh, start out with the right thing, which is to stop mm -hmm. the activity or the exercise if there is new bleeding and to use that application of rice. And also, even before that, to follow whatever your specific instructions are for factor replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, from your provider. So then rice for anybody on that doesn't know what that is. Uh, rest, so stop the activity, rest that particular area. Uh, the I is for ice, um, C is for compression, and E is elevate. Uh, so those, that's the first thing that you would do. As far as your question as to how long to do that and when to return, um, it is going to be a little bit individual, individualized based on um, how soon you recognize the bleed, how soon it was treated, um, and that the activity was stopped. Some general guidelines, though, are um, to uh, make sure that you have at least 90% of the range of motion. So let's just say it was an elbow. So making sure that you've got it, you know, at least 90% of your normal range of motion. So 
knowing what that is before having a new bleed, not expecting it to you know, get better than it was. But um, if you had full straightening and full bending of the elbow, we want to get to 90 to 100% of that before returning to activity, as well as 90 to 100% of the strength in that area. So we don't want to start challenging that joint until it has that strength back. Um, and then also recognizing what the pain level is. So if there's still maybe a one or two uh, level of pain, but range of motion is back, strength is back, everything seems okay. Um, if you can do the activity without increasing that baseline level of pain, that's okay. Um, if, it, if it makes your pain level jump up, then it's too soon and you should stop. Um, and then the only other thing that I would point out with that is when there is an acute uh, bleeding episode, uh, it is important to continue to be active with your other extremities, uh, with the rest of your body. So what we don't want to do is uh, stop moving completely. Let's say it's an elbow bleed um, and spend a few days on the couch because then you're also having to rehab, you know, kind of get the strength back in the rest of your body. So if it's, a, if it's in an arm, continue to do stuff with your legs, continue to walk around. If it's something in your legs, do some of those arm exercises, arm movement. You can still increase heart rate and breathing during that time. Yeah, um, that's exact. I mean, those are exact same things we would look at for the pediatric patient. Sometimes it's hard to um, assess their pain and to know if something is still hurting. And then you just have to watch more closely to see if they're moving it the same as they were before. And one of the um, other main ways that we look at to see if they're back to almost their baseline is to make sure that they're moving the other side the same as the side they hurt so that there's no asymmetrical movement so that they're not limping on one foot or they're not um, avoiding using that elbow or that one arm so that they're using um, both arms the same so that we're not seeing um, any asymmetrical movements is um, one of the key things that we look at especially for the younger pediatric patients um, and then the other thing that I would also say is if you know what activity caused the bleed or if you think you know what activity caused the bleed, that it would be especially important to um, modify that activity, that specific exercise um, that you did that may have caused that bleed. Great, thank you. Um, well, it looks like that is all the questions that have come in for now. If anybody else who's on has any last minute questions they'd like to type into the Q&A feature, please do so now. In the meantime, I will share um, one of the websites that's up here on your screen is stepsforliving.hemophilia.org. And we do actually have some very short, manageable um, fitness videos. We have Tai Chi. Uh, let's see, yoga, they're all about 20 minutes, and there's a fun dance one. Um, they're not too long, so you could incorporate it possibly on that little break in your day between Zoom meetings. Um, and there's a modified, um, someone doing like a modified version of a lot of the activities on all of them. So that's just another resource that you guys have through all of this. So it looks as though no other questions have come in. I would truly love to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us this evening. That was a really great talk. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Um, I would also like to thank the community who has joined on and asked really great questions. Um, and you know, please know that this uh, webinar is being recorded, so it'll be available on Monday um, for anyone who is not able to view it or if you would like to view it again. Um, it'll be on hemophilia.org. Um, we have a section that hosts all of our COVID-related content. Um, and our next weekly issue of our health and wellness e-newsletter from the desk of your very own Dr. Len Valentino here will hit your inbox on Thursday morning with the latest updates on COVID and additional resources. And just in the nick of time, we actually have two last questions that have come in. So I will make sure that these get answered very quickly. So the first is, our are the blood clots from using Hemlibra a result of lack of exercise? I think that references to the earlier slide yeah. on Hemlibra. Yeah. yeah we, we don't have detailed information on that. Uh, but, it, you know, exercise is important for everybody. So uh, we'll definitely look into that. But, you know, lack of exercise does increase your risk. So it would be important for all of us to, to continue to exercise. 
Thank you. And our last one is, will this um, webinar be available for Spanish-speaking families? I am so glad this question came up. We actually hosted our very first um, Spanish COVID webinar on Tuesday, and we are doing those monthly on the third Tuesday of the month. So the next one isn't coming up until May, but we are definitely going to make sure that some of these physical activity um, topics get incorporated, as well as all the other really pressing issues um, that people have this time and trying to serve the wide variety of family members and community members needs during this time. So thank you for asking that question. Um, and that Spanish first Spanish webinar will also be up um, early next week on our website. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, and just a reminder that NHF is here for you. And thank you to all of our panelists. Be safe and well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.